Thank you, John. Good morning. How's everybody doing? You know, I, I, I've preached before, but never in the U.S. So if I, if I start in another language, I'm not speaking in tongues, okay? <laughs> you know, it, it's really amazing how God puts our Sunday morning worships together. You know, all the way from the, from the music, that uh, Becca and puts together with uh, her partners to the prayer. Uh, I asked Jesse to pray this morning because the person who was going to pray before was not available. So Jesse came up and he, he prayed exactly what this message is about. And so, you know, to God be the glory. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Father, for how you work in our lives, in spite of us. Father, how we can come to you in any situation, and we know that you are in control. Father, we know that you have the best for us, and you help us to manage and face each of the situations we encounter. And Father, you've called us. You've called us to be the light to be the light of your son. And so, Father, that's what we want to do. And, Father, as I bring this story, this message of the Good Samaritan, Father, that you would just use me as your conduit, Father, that your words be spoken out and your message be sent, and that your message be the one that received, that it's not I, but that you be glorified. And I ask you this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1994, a man by the name of Richard Miles was sentenced to prison at the age of 19 for a murder that he did not commit. He spent 60 years in prison. And after 15 years, he was exonerated. He was released. He wasn't exonerated to 2012, but he was released in, in 2009. And so he gets back into his community. And he says in his own words, I came back and I was scared. I mean, I didn't know anything about living in the community. You know, I was, I was 34 in age, but I was really 19 in society standards. So just think about it. He came, he was in prison in 1994 and came out 15 years later in 2009. 1998 through 2002 was when the internet was birthed. So just think of that going back to the future, right? Or going forward. You know, he comes out and there's this internet, smartphones, computers, laptops, and things that he has never seen. And so he's very, very, very confused. And so as, as he struggled for two years after the release, and he finally got through and <clears throat> he got his feet on the ground, he got married, and, and he has a child. And so he founded a non-for-profit in Dallas. And this non-for-profit is to help his community. His community were incarcerated people, families impacted by incarceration. So he, this, this um, non-for-profit takes men that are coming out of prison, helps them readjust entry into society, because you know the, the, the facts say that 70% uh, end, back, end, end up back in the prison because they really don't know how to adjust into society. So he helps them adjust, helps them to get jobs, helps them to computer literacy and all the different kinds of things that he didn't have when he came out. And so uh, his comprehensive ser service of reentry was, was fantastic. And then in 2012, three years later, he was exonerated, and he was innocent. So how do we serve and reach out as Richard Miles did? How do we minister to our community like he did to his, which was the prison community and probably people in where he lived physically? 
So community outreach is an essential part of our church mission. It's, we're supposed to be the salt and the light to those around us. In Matthew 5, 13 through 14, Christ says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus says, I am the way, John 14, 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. So what is community outreach? Community outreach is about giving, contributing, helping those who cannot help themselves. Uh, Sue got a text from somebody that can't be there on Thursday night and she mentioned that she has a neighbor, old, elderly neighbor who, who has a tree branch in her yard that's about ready to fall. So obviously she can't crawl up into the tree and with a chainsaw, right? So helping those who cannot help themselves is a good example. Community outreach allows us to influence younger generations to give back to the community. Carrie with, with his four kids now, right? And, you know, so they ask him, you know, 10 years from now, why do you do this? Why do you always go out and do things for people just out of your heart? So it influences our next generation and even our current generation, our, our youth, high school, middle school, and, and uh, elementary school. So community outreach helps the community grow in a substantial way by giving, contributing, and obviously helping those who cannot help themselves. This is what Richard was doing. As we, as we go into our text, let me, uh, I want to review where we are, because our text is in, in Luke 10. And so, in Luke 9, as we back up a chapter, this is where Jesus has sent out the 12 apostles to Israelites, to other Israelites, to the nation, to their brothers. So they're in Galilee. Okay. This is also the, the chapter where he feeds the 5,000 in Luke, which is repeated. It's also where Christ talks about picking up your cross and following him. It's also the transfiguration that takes place. It's also about healing a boy with an unclean spirit. It's where Jesus foretells his death. And then toward the end, toward chapter 51 of that chapter, 9, this is about the Samaritan village that rejects Jesus. So obviously he has come from Galilee into Samaria, going down into Judea. And so to go from Galilee to there, you had to pass through Samaria, which people, Jews, did not do. And that's for another time. But it says in verse 51, he says, when the days draw, days draw near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So he's going th from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem, passing through Samaria. Uh, he's going to fulfill his mission. He's already sent out his 72. Now the 72, as we see in chapter 10, have been set out in verse 1, and then they return in verse 17, and they're really excited. They said, Jesus, you wouldn't believe. Even the demons obeyed us. So they were casting out demons, and they were so excited that God had given them the power. And Jesus addressed this incongruity that God unexpectedly had hidden these things from the wise and intelligent who failed to respond. Let us not be those. And reveal them to the infants, the opposite of the wise and intelligent who did respond. His 72 disciples. So the parallel of the Samaritan now amplifies this astonishing result. It is a hated outsider rather than those who serve in the temple in Jerusalem who faithfully obeys the command 
to love God and to love their neighbor as themselves. So as we move into Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 27, we, this is where we're going. So number one, we're going to see what, what the Lord says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Then we'll see who is my neighbor. And then finally, we'll see who acted as that neighbor. So verse 25, he goes and he says, he says, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? So I am going to assume or presume that uh, Jesus was teaching to a crowd of, of Gentiles, of Samaritans, Samaritans, and that this Lord was in the crowd. And so this Lord, and I'm sure teaches was te- uh, Jesus was teaching on the kingdom. And so this Lord in the crowd stands up and he, and he, and he, won, and he asked Jesus what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. Now the Lord was testing like it says, testing Jesus. The Lord was knowledgeable about the Torah, what it said. So, I mean, he, he, he knew the Torah forwards and backwards, the first five books of the, of the law, and so he just was testing it. And, he's, and we see here, we, I just commented about those things hidden from the wise and intelligent. So the Lord was one of those wise and intelligent men of Israel. He knew the law. He could administer, he could talk about it to others that, that didn't know it. Failed to respond. He had failed to respond and he wanted justification. He was starting to feel guilty. So Jesus answers the Lord with a question, what is written in the law and how do you read it? Now this is a great way to respond to that question. He was so wise. By responding with a question of his own, He put the responsibility of the answer back on the lawyer so that Jesus didn't have to go into some type of argument. Then in verse 27, he says, And he answered, the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. So Jesus just had the lawyer answer his own question. The lawyer quotes Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.8, which are the fifth and the third book of the Torah. He knew the law. And Jesus commends him. It's great the way he says he commends him. He says, you answered correctly. Good for you. Then Jesus says to him, do this and you will live. But the lawyer now is wanting to deflect attention from the first law. He really doesn't want to talk about loving God with all his heart. So he wants to deflect his attention. So in verse 29, he says, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now the lawyer's second question was meant to distract Christ from the first question or the first command. The lawyer felt if he pursued it, he would condemn himself when he was, he was resolved, but he was resolved to justify himself. So as to loving God, He was willing to say no more of it. But as to his neighbor, he said, I got this. He was sure that there he had come up to the rule. I know how to love my neighbor, for he had always been very kind and respectful of all those about him. So what was the corrupt notion of the Jewish teachers in those times? Teachers in this matter define your neighbor where he saith, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, he accepts the Gentiles, for they are not our neighbors. 
but those only that are our own nation, religion, look like us, talk like us, so forth. They would not put an Israelite to death for killing a Gentile. Why? For he was not his neighbor. If they saw a Gentile in danger of death, they thought themselves under no obligation to go and help him. Such wicked references, inferences did draw from that holy covenant of God. And so God took what the Israelites forfeited in turn and transferred the covenant favors over to the Gentile world. In verse 30 where he says, going up, he replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell, fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now Jesus does not respond to the question that the Lord was intending, expecting him to respond with. Probably, uh, you know, love the guy next to you or love your physical neighbor, the, the other lawyers and stuff like that. But he tells him a parable. He says, amen. We don't know clearly what, who this man was, but he says, now the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles long. And it, dis it descended at an altitude of 1,800 feet. It was known for its danger. So you're going from Jerusalem down into Jericho. It was known for its danger because the road through this area of deserts and caves gave the robbers a place to hide. It was desolate. And many people during this time did not have extra clothes which were thus a valuable item to steal. You know, come up and steal them, weigh them, and take all their clothes. And but though clothes are, were a valuable commodity, having completely stripped them, left him like a corpse on a battlefield. You know, during the Civil War of 1861 through 1865, the Confederate soldiers in the last two years were pretty down to very, very few items. The Union Army had already, in 19, 1863, they had lost, the Confederates had lost the Battle of Gettysburg, and then Grant took Vicksburg, which they then controlled the Mississippi River, and so the blockade from the Mississippi and around the ocean, so the Confederates were pretty well surrounded. So they weren't getting supplies for clothes and guns and shoes and stuff like that. So you read about it. You read about the... Uh, the soldiers after a war, you see them going through the dead. And they're taking off shoes that fit them and taking off coats for them to use. And so this is what these robbers had just done to this man. It says they stripped him of everything that he had. And they left him for dead. And so in verse 31, we read that he sa it says, Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he had come to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. So you, you look at this and, and you start to three, fir, three first words. It says, now by chance. All right, here comes some help, right? It's like uh, you're, you're driving and you're, you're somewhere south of here and your car stalls and, and, and you know you can't get your car started and so somebody who lives in, Ar in, in uh, Argyle just happens to drive by and they ha stop and they help you and they'll say well it's just by chance I didn't I usually don't take this road this right so you know you think is it's now by chance this priest because he's going from Jerusalem down to Jericho which means that he doesn't have any duties in the temple. So nothing that he has to go back to. And so that adds initial hope to the story. But what happens? It is not said why the priest or the Levite passed by or refused to help. But the text does tell us that the priest and Levite went out of their way on the other side not to get close to the scene. They avoided it on purpose. The priests were supposed to avoid especially impurity from the corpse, and the Pharisees 
thought one could contact this impurity even if their shadow fell on the corpse. In verse 31, so he says, hence he was going from Jerusalem, so he did not have to worry about being unable to perform duties in the temple, to be pure, because in, in, in that type, as far as the Levitical law, was the priest had to be pure in, in order to perform their duties in the temple for other people. But he didn't have to worry about that. But although the rule of mercy would take precedence if the man were clearly alive, the man looked as he might be dead, which tells us that in verse 30. And the priest did not wish to take the chance of contact, contracting impurity. And so he says, well, the task might be left better to a Levite or an order, ordinary Israelite. So the behavior of the priest was not new. If you look at the Old Testament in Hosea, chapter 6, 9, it says, as robbers lie in wait for a man. Now, Hosea was written in 760 B.C., you know, 750, somewhere in there, B.C., before Christ. It says, as robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests band together, they murder on the way to Shechem. They commit the villainy. So on the road to Shechem, the priests became involved in mur murdering defenseless people. So the pattern, 600 years later, is still continuing in the sense that they didn't care. So we have two religious men, the priest and the Levite, who ignore the man in need. And as we move into verse 33, it says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and he, when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring an oil on wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So here is what's, what made the Samaritan different. It says in verse 31, he had compassion. And so compassion here expresses love. So the Samaritan had love for this man he didn't know, and he went and he bound him. Interestingly, here we have Jesus. He doesn't use an Israelite as a third person. Okay, we have two people, and now this is third, but he doesn't use that. He uses an outsider, an alien, a Samaritan. The priest and Levite had passed by at a safe distance and made no attempt to contact the man on the ground. But the Samaritan went directly to the man. The Samaritan was presumably as aware as the travelers before him that if he went to this man in so doing, he was also vulnerable to be robbed. And not only to be robbed, or he himself could be suspected of being the one that attacked this guy and was robbing him. But the Samaritan does what the priest and the Levite do not do. He makes contact with a man and is moved with compassion. He's moved with love. The ancient practice of pouring oil and wine was designed to comfort and clean wounds. You can see this in Isaiah 1.6. His own animal refers to a riding animal and it's presumably a donkey, but not specific. It says in verse 34, brought him to an inn, took care of him. That's amazing. You know, he didn't, he didn't put him on his animal and take him down to the ER and just drop him off at the door and take off. You know, he took him to this inn. This Samaritan spent the night nursing this guy, a stranger, somebody he didn't know. And the next day, verse 35, he took out to Denera and gave him to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. You know, significantly, it's the hated foreigner who is commended by Jesus, all right? 
completely flipped around. And this Samaritan demonstrates the love that is not constrained by ethnic boundaries. This love that is not constrained by ethnic boundaries. Because they don't look like us. Because they don't talk like us. Because they don't dress like us. Because they don't go in the same circles that we go. So that's what Christ is, is saying about this Samaritan. You know, he's not constrained, which we shouldn't be constrained, should not be constrained also. Now, two silver coins were a denarii. And a silver coin was worth a day's pay of labor. So when he gave him two denarii, he basically gave him four silver coins, or he gave him four days' wages, which is a lot. I mean, if you think about yourself, you know, 40 hours that you work and divide that by eight, and that's how much you make a day, and, you know, and through the month. I mean, so, I mean, it's not like it's, that's all you live on. I mean, it's accumulative. So, I mean, four days of wages that could uh, given to the innkeeper, which was uh, been enough to take care of the man for a week or more. You know, and he tells him, and if you spend more, I will come back and, rep and I'll repay you when I come back. And this, of course, was an incentive to the innkeeper because here I've got four days of wages and I take care of this guy and this guy's leaving and he says he'll come back. But so, you know, he's, he, 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 he can take care of him. He has a way to do it. As we move to verse 36, it says, which of these three, this is Jesus talking to the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer answers, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So in the counter question of verse 29 above, Jesus indicates that one should worry less about who a neighbor is than about being a good neighbor. To be a good neighbor. Jesus' counter question reverses the role so that, so that just as Jesus answered the lawyer's question in 1029, the lawyer had to answer Jesus' question. Who's my neighbor? And he asked him, who showed mercy on him? Or the one who is his neighbor, the one who showed mercy. So he says, you go do, and do the same. That's your neighbor. Note the Lord's avoidance of the term Samaritan. He didn't use it. It was a Samaritan, which would have been easier, more natural way. But he said, who, who showed mercy on him? Now the command do frames the parable. We have a command do in verse 28 where Jesus tells them to do this and you will live when the, the, the lawyer answers Jesus' question about what does it say in the Bible, what do you think? And he says, great, do this and you will live. And then right here, in the last verse, in verse 37, who is my neighbor? And he answers and he says, do this, go and do likewise. So both, both of these do's encompass our parable. So who is your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love that is not constrained by ethnic boundaries. Worry less about who a neighbor is than about being a neighbor. Mother Teresa, you know, she served her, low, her whole life in the slums of Calcutta in India. Gave her whole life. She was a nun. And she says the following, this is God's wish for us, to serve through love in action and be inspired by the Holy Spirit to act when called. If the Holy Spirit is wrestling with you right now, knocking at your door, he's acting on you to act when called. Remember that it is Christ who works through us. We are merely his instruments. It is Christ who works through us. We are merely his instruments. So the pressure is really on Christ, not on us, the Holy Spirit. It is not how much we do, but how much love we put into the doing. So do one thing with all your love is more important 
and doing ten things without love. And it's all about Jesus. So being a neighbor is all about Jesus. Community outreach creates the crucial platform to a church's evangelistic efforts. The greatest difference between outreach and evangelism is that outreach is primarily an action and evangelism is primarily a message. Being a neighbor is about giving, contributing, helping those who cannot help themselves. Allow us to influence younger generations to give back to the community, it's not about us, and help the community grow in a substantial way. Now this was really something that the Lord revealed to me, obviously through scripture and through some reading and stuff. But this parable is applicable to another purpose than that for which it was intended. This parable excellently sets forth the kindness and love of God our Savior towards sinful, miserable man. We were like this poor, distressed traveler. Satan, our enemy, had robbed us, stripped us, wounded us. Such is the mischief that sin had done us. We were by nature more than half dead, twice dead, in trespasses and sins, utterly unable to help ourselves, for we were without strength. The law of Moses, like the priest and the Levite, the ministers of the law, looks upon us, but has no compassion on us, gives us no relief, passes by on the other side, as having neither pity nor power to help us. But then comes the blessed Jesus, that good Samaritan. And they said of him, by way of reproach, he is a Samaritan. He has compassion on us. He binds us up our bleeding wounds. He pours in not oil and wine, but that which is infinitely more precious, his own blood. He takes care of us and binds us, puts all the expense of our cure upon his account. All this, to do, though he was none of us, all this, though he was none of us, till he was pleased by his voluntary condensation, condensation to make himself so, but infinitely above us. That's Jesus. Jesus' mission. Jesus says, I have come, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. I was that guy on the road, literally. And I was a sinner. I was lost. And so what does Christ say? He, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. So it's all about Jesus. Only evangelism fulfills his command to take the good news to all the world. In this gospel, the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world, whole world, as a testimony to all nations, out of Matthew 24, 14. Now, I want to clarify something, because, and we'll see as I talk about, you know, outreach goes into evangelism, and I'll, and I'll kind of follow the role there, but, but I want to clarify something. It's something that has been a subject on my heart for, for quite a while, and I've read a lot about it, read books, picked up different things and stuff like that. But the subject is whatever happened to the gospel. And unfortunately, that has gone by the wayside. And so, the gospel has been watered down. Okay? Go look on your televangelists. I mean, what is the message primary that they preach? Now, people doing evangelism and outreach and talking to others will say things, and don't misunderstand me, that an outreach is perfectly okay, and I, and I clarify this. They come up and they say, hey, God loves you, and he wants the best for your life. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be his child and be part of his family. You are a good person. Yes. We do want to say these things to the people that we minister to. 
as we encourage them, as we reach out to them, as we tell them that, yeah, God loves you, and yes, he wants the best for you, and you're down deep, you want to try to be a good person. These are all good statements that should lead us to presenting the gospel. We need to share that we are sinners and that the man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world, took on all our iniquities, all our sins, and died on the cross for our sins, for yours and mine, was buried and rose again from the dead after three days and ascended at the right hand of God. In all this, we could have eternal life because he lives. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So if anybody ever asks you, where's this gospel you're talking about, take them to 1 Corinthians 50, chapter 15, 1 through 4. He suffered humiliation, physical pain, ridicule, all so that you and I could have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and be given eternal life. It's a free gift. Romans chapter 4 is justification by faith alone, apart from works. So we can't do anything to justify. Isaiah 53, 7, it says he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Why would he go through that? He paid a price for eternal life that I could not pay. Because of his love for you and me is why he went through this. He wants you and me to have a better life, to have the true life, to have the real life. In multiplication, the twain shall meet. So outreach leads to relationships. I think I was talking to a, a brother of mine early this, before the service, and he mentioned that about relationships. And that leads to evangelism. That leads to discipleship. That leads to outreach. That leads to relationships. And it becomes cyclical. It is not about performance. It's about love. It's not about performance. It's about love. And it's not about numbers. It's about relationships. So if you have one relationship and that person is being discipled and you're pouring into that one person, that's the person you gotta pour into, okay? So it's not about numbers and it's about love. Multiplication, so what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what does he say? What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many generations? Four generations in this verse. An example of that is Mark 5, verse 1 through 20. Now, this is a story of the demon-possessed man. And so, uh, naked and living among the tombs. So Jesus heals this man. So Jesus has come from the other side of the sea, and he gets on shore, and he sees this demon-possessed man in, in, the grave, in the cemetery. And so he's crazy. You know, nobody's been able to... Uh, to main, you know, maintain or even chains or anything like that. So he comes up to him, and, and the demons inside this, this man yell out to Jesus to give, show us mercy. And Jesus says, what's your name? He says, Legion. So this man doesn't have just one demon. He has a legion of demons. And they, say, they, they pray and beseech him, and they say, Jesus, please just let us go into this herd of pigs. And so Jesus consents, and they go into this herd of pigs, a large herd of pigs. And these pigs take off. Once the demons get in, these pigs take off down that hill, and they fall over the cliff into the sea, and they're drowned. So the herdsmen, they run into the city, and they tell all the people and their, the owners of their pigs, and the, the rest of them say, look, this is what happened. 
And so the townspeople, they want to go see for themselves. So they all come out, and as they're going back, they come back in, in, to the cemetery, and they see the demon-possessed man in his right mind, fully clothed, sitting there. So what do they say to Jesus? Do they say, oh, man, what did you do? We won some of that. No, they say, Get that, you know, leave us. Please go. We're terrified. Just leave us. So Jesus goes, and he gets on a boat, ready to leave on the boat. And the demon-possessed man comes up to Jesus and says, let me go with you. And Jesus says, no. He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Go. Repeat. Take the message. And as we see in verse 20 of that, the last verse that I don't have up here, but it says, And he went away... And he began to proclaim in the Decapolis, Deca, ten cities, how much Jesus has done for him, and everyone marveled. So there you have your second generation. He's already going into his third generation. No, no one, you can't tell how many people got saved by his going back and being obedient to Christ. And then as we see in the, cha in the book, uh, chapter 7 of the same book, it says in verse 31 that Jesus healed a deaf man in the region of the capitalists. So this is two chapters later. The demon had been, demon possessed man had been in there witnessing and praising God and everything like that. And then Jesus comes along and there's people that are ready to receive him. So that is the multiplication. You know, we have here at Denia Church, we have opportunities. Remember, it's about love and it's not about numbers. So it's not performance, it's willingness and loving. We have Borman and Tim Sutton. I was, I was, when I was going through that, I was, I was calling him Tim Borman, but then I remember it's Tim Sutton. You know, we've been there two years, and there's a principle that I use on mission trips. Last year, I'm trying to think, in uh, school year of 1819, uh, or is it? Yes, that Eileen got into Borman, right? So that was the first year, Eileen Morse. And then this year, uh, Tim has stepped up to, to co-lead and, and take a lot of the responsibility and just be effective. That's the second year. Well, the first year that Eileen went to Borman to help these teachers, they probably said, oh, she's come to help us. Great, we need all the help we can get, right? Now this year is the second year, and so when they come back and, they, and Tim's in there, come with somebody new, the teachers are saying, oh, they came back. They can help us. All right, next year when we go back, what are they going to say? You must love us. You know, action speaks louder than words. And by those, the, the, those premises that I use, the third time people take you serious and say, you must really love us. It's not something. And you're committed to help us. And that's what we are. So Borman, I just love that ministry. I mean, there's a lot that's going to be able, we can, we can do that, not only for the teachers specifically, because they need help, but the students. And guess what, what the students have? Parents. Right? So we'll be able to minister to students, be able to minister to parents, and be able to minister to our community. We have middle school. Uh, Jesse's around here somewhere. We have middle school, high school. We have young adults, adults, women's ministry, men's ministry, lawn ministry, I don't know, potluck ministry, Chinese pilots ministry, you know, all different types of ministries that we've done the last year. And so, and we have more ideas. And so basically you guys come on Thursday night. We want ideas. We want ways to get out into our community, you know, to show the love. And by the way, October the 17th is going to be our make, what's it called? Keep Denia Keep Denia Beautiful. So we're going to do Keep Denia Beautiful. So we're going to minister in the, this community. And we're doing it outside of the dates that they have set for us, which... Uh, usually provides a t-shirt, but we're not going to get a t-shirt. We're going to get our own t-shirts. We're going to get a t-shirt with the word Denia, our logo. 
and we're going to be out there making, letting people know who we are, you know, and we're, they're going to provide us all the supplies. So they're going to give us whatever it is. They give us trash bags and so forth and gloves and all that kind of stuff. So we'll have all that. So that's the 17th, October 17th. So mark that on your calendar. Before that day, uh, Thursday night before the 17th, we'll meet and um, I'm going to train you. I'm not going to teach you. I'm going to train you. Why do you think I train you? I train you so you can train somebody else. I'm going to train you on how to start gospel conversations. I'm going to train you on what, what do you say. I'm going to train you, you know, how to comfortably. A lot of people already do that. A lot of people are comfortable. There's some people that don't. You know, some people that, well, what do I do? This guy just accepted Christ, so what do I do with him? Pat him on the back and say, I'll see you later? You know, no. I mean, we try to disciple. So basically, we want to get prepared for that first major outreach. Our second major outreach is, is trunk or treat, which is the 31st of October, right? We have the go with that, I believe. And so we're in charge of that. So there's another, so there's two great opportunities to reach out to our community. That's why we do it. So you're gonna be trained. The Good Samaritan, you said we have this till two o'clock? <laughs> uh, the Good Samaritan, I'm, I'm going to train you on how to use parables. Conversationally. You're not going to say, well, you know, here in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 27, and let's read. No, you're going to learn how to tell it. You know, you're going to learn how to tell the parable of the sinful woman. You're going to learn how to tell the parable of Zacchaeus. All these parables, why? Because you're going to get into conversations with people in a normal way. People will receive, people will talk to you and, you know, pray for them. They'll, they'll receive you. They'll open up for you. So we're going to be trained. And so it's, it's basically, it's called the SBR. What does that stand for? It's simple. It's biblical. And it's reproducible. Everything is based on the Bible. That's what we're preaching. Nothing else. Oh, I read this book. No. I read Tozer. Great. But no, it's the Bible. We're going to reference the Bible. So we, we see how Jesus has been, has, been, has been the Good Samaritan to us. This magnifies the riches of his love, obliges us all to say, and what Jesse said, how much am I indebted? What shall I render? In 1969, Tim, I don't know this, but maybe not, on, on a Sunday night, Kurt Kaiser, the songwriter, was sitting in his den by the fireplace where there were remnants of a fire. And it occurred to him that it only takes a spark to get a fire going. So he began to write a song, 1969, and it came quickly, and his wife suggested that he, that he include something about shouting it from the mountaintops, and that ended up in the third verse. What is the name of the song? What? Pass it, Pass it on. Here's some lyrics. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love, once you've experienced it. You spread the love to everyone you want to pass it on. You want to sing, it's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, that this happiness that I've found, you can depend on God, it matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountaintop, praise God. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me, I want to pass it on. When I received Christ as my Lord and Savior in a motel room in Midland, Texas, this song resonated in my heart, and it defined my life, to pass it on. The only thing I didn't have was a mountain to go shout it from, but I was ready, you know? And so I needed to pass it on. And so that defined my life, and we need to pass it on. 
So in a room with this many people, I know that there is at least one person that this parable has spoken of to you, to your hearts. And in closing, I want to say, get alone by yourself or with a friend and read Romans 10.9. Romans 10.9 says, If you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Christ is knocking at your door. He wants to come in. And that door doesn't have a knob on the outside. You've got to let him in. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. And Father, just... Um, let your spirit flow forth, Father, what you want to do with it. Uh, touch the people that you want to touch. Use the people that you want to use, Father, as we, as we move forward with the uh, outreach ministry, Father, that you would call those that you have already identified. And so, Father, we just praise you and thank you for that ahead of time. Thank you for this morning. Amen.